From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. I'm Dr. Kristen Walter, Senior Editor at JAMA. I'm joined today by Fernando Zampieri, Assistant Professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Alberta in Alberta, Canada. We will be discussing his article published in the June 13th issue of JAMA entitled Fluid Therapy in Critically Ill Adults. Welcome, Dr. Zampieri. Thank you so much for the invitation. Kristen, it's a pleasure to be here. Your review discusses intravenous fluids, which in addition to vasopressors and antibiotics are an essential component of therapy for sepsis. I was hoping we could start with you discussing why effective intravascular volume is decreased in sepsis. That's a very good question, right? So there are uh, two main mechanisms for a decrease in intravascular volume in sepsis or effective intravascular volume in sepsis. And the major one seems to be vasodilatation, right? So you have an increase in venous capacity in sepsis due to toxins, and that may uh, reduce uh, the effective arterial volume and that may reduce cardiac output. Additionally, due to inflammation, you may have some leakage for fluid to the interstitial space, which may also corroborate to the reduction in effective intravascular volume, and septic patients may be hypovolemic during their initial presentation. Can you discuss some of the factors that affect the distribution of fluid in the body? So this is a very important point. Uh, There are some factors that may increase fluid extravasation to the interstitial space. So one of those factors is how fast you give fluid to the patients, whether blood pressure is low or normal, whether patients are anesthetized or not, that may actually increase the degree of extravasation to the interstitial. And all these factors may also change the dynamics of fluid reabsorption, right, to the intravascular space. And fluid therapy can result in improved hemodynamics, but excessive fluid administration can cause complications from tissue edema. Can you discuss some of the potential negative effects of IV fluids? So uh, septic patients will require a large volume resuscitation. And a part of this, all this fluid, that's given during the resuscitation phase will eventually lead to the interstitial space and may cause organ tissue edema and therefore organ dysfunction. If you give a lot of fluids to a septic patient, you may increase intra-abdominal pressure to a degree that you actually impair organ function because of poor perfusion. A high volume of high fluid load may actually cause tissue edema on other sides, and such as lung, even heart maybe or uh, kidneys, liver, uh, and these may result in, in organ dysfunction. However, it's hard in practice to separate what uh, is actually caused by fluid overload and what is part of the natural history of organ dysfunction in sepsis. Your review article discusses how fluid therapy can be conceptualized as four overlapping phases, resuscitation, optimization, stabilization, and evacuation. Could you discuss those different phases? So the resuscitation phase is when patient is initial phase, when patients are admitted to the hostel on the ER in the very first hours after a septic event. So in that phase, your major concern or main target is to increase tissue perfusion by giving fluid bowls or optimizing hemodynamics using vasopressors or enotropes. So this is a short phase where you should aim to normalize targets for resuscitation. Then right up when the patient is a little bit more stable, let's say, you move towards an optimization phase where you are now less worried about giving fast food bowls and you are more concerned about keeping the patient optimized. So you are targeting to keep resuscitation targets like capillary refill time, lactate, central venous oxygenation saturation on a normal range. And this may or may not include further food bowls. But at this time, clinicians should be a little bit more cautious uh, before giving fluids after the initial resuscitation. Then the second phase actually blends with the next phase, which is a stabilization phase, which should, which refers to a period of time after the patient has been optimized and you are actually having to deal with uh, organ dysfunctions that happen due to sepsis. So in, during this phase, 
Uh, you may still consider fluid bowls here and there or fluid optimization if the patient is fully responsive, but you are more concerned about uh, estimating, measuring, and treating organ dysfunction, like kidney dysfunction, for example. So you're considering whether that patient may need renal replacement therapy uh, or whether that patient needs mechanical ventilation or any other uh, type of organ support. And then eventually, after this phase, you move towards the evacuation phase. So when the patient is stable, this is usually a longer phase. It's connected to uh, rehabilitation during uh, ICU care. So during this phase, patients are going to have their fluids evacuated some way. They can do that spontaneously if they are improving or they may need diuretics or kidney replacement therapy so that fluid uh, accumulation can be solved. And critically ill patients primarily receive IV fluids in one of four forms, or maybe more than one, fluid challenge, fluid bolus, maintenance or replacement fluid, or part of parenteral nutrition and medication dilutant or carrier. Can you discuss the difference between fluid challenge and fluid bolus? Okay, so uh, fluid challenge is usually defined as a short, fast administration of a small uh, bolus of fluid over a short period of time followed by an immediate reassessment of uh, perfusion parameters like heart rate or lactate or cardiac output or something that you're willing to target during your early resuscitation. A fluid bolus, on the other hand, is uh, the administration of a larger volume of fluid, let's say half a liter over a liter, over a relatively short period of time with the goal of increasing intravascular volume. But you're not actually measuring or estimating response as fast as during the fluid challenge. Uh, this distinction is, is important because sometimes when the patient is in, on the emergency department, for example, and you, and you don't have access to different tools to assess fluid responsiveness, an easy way or a proper way to as quickly assess whether the patient benefited of fluids or not is to just give a small, fast bolus and reassess, for example, heart rate or perfusion using capillary refill time. So this is why we feel like fluid challenge should be seen as different from uh, fluid boluses. Then we go for maintenance. Uh, so maintenance fluids are usually infused over a constant rate or a slow rate over a period of time. And this is usually prescribed to account for losses such, such as drain losses or losses due to perspiration or fever, which may be an issue, especially if the patient's not intubated. And that may be used to keep intravascular volume filled up over a longer period of time. And of course, dilutions and medication and imperative nutrition are part of, are inevitable for, for most particularly ill patients. But I want to highlight that excessive use of fluid maintenance and other infusions for dilutions and total parental nutrition, etc. these uh, can quickly lead to fluid accumulation. This has been sometimes labeled as fluid creep where you add, you give too much fluid for reasons that are not related to improving perfusion, right? So these are not fluid challenges or fluid bowls. Uh, these are fluids that are given as part of ICU care. Can you discuss how you can predict fluid responsiveness in patients? This has been subject of several, several studies, and there are many, many, many examples in literature, right? So first of all, we have to define what is fluid responsiveness, and this is usually defined as an increase in cardiac output of at least 10% after a fluid bolus or fluid charge, right? So, of course, you want to minimize fluid bolus or fluid challenges that are not going to increase cardiac output. Therefore, you want to predict before you give fluids if the patient will actually increase their cardiac output after a fluid charge. So, uh, there are two main types of predictors. So static predictors, like, for example, heart rate, central venous pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, or other parameters that may be used. But we know that those static parameters, especially static filling pressures, they are not good to discriminate patients that will or will not increase their cardiac output after flu challenge. So in order to make a more educated assessment, we can use dynamic measurements of fluid responsiveness. And those dynamic measurements, they usually test heart-lung interactions or the response of the cardiovascular system 
to an increase in feeling volume through several ways. So if the patient is spontaneously breathing and can be mobilized, one not so simple, but one test that can be made is the passive leg raising, where you actually increase, you raise the patient's legs, which is equal or very similar to a 300, 400 ml bolus for the circulation. And you see how cardiac output changes during the maneuver. So if cardiac output increases during a passive leg raise assessment, there is a, a high predictive value that the patient will actually increase cardiac output after a fluid bolus. There are other ways to do so. Uh, for example, assessing changes in stroke volume and pulse pressure during uh, mechanical ventilation. But of course, these methods, they usually require the patient to be sedated, mechanically ventilated, and there are some specific caveats for doing those, and they may also not apply for all critically ill patients. All these methods, they require, at least to some degree, an estimation of cardiac output that can be done on the bad side using echocardiogram. And your review also discusses point-of-care ultrasound that can be useful to evaluate the etiology of shock and to predict fluid responsiveness. Can you discuss some of the information that point-of-care ultrasound can provide in this regard and some caveats about its use? Point-of-care ultrasound is, is now an essential component of patient management in the emergency department or in the ICU. So POCUS refers to a bedside ultrasonography exam made by the attending physician with the aim of obtaining diagnostic information or assessing response to therapy. So you can also check for signs of hypovolemia on POCUS, like a small vena cava, a vena cava, a pure vena cava with large swings during respiration. And of course, POCUS can also be used, as I mentioned before, to assess food responsiveness. So you can actually estimate cardiac output using POCUS and you can then you can perform a passive leg raising, see if cardiac output changes, and then you can make an informed decision on whether to give fluids or not. Focus can also be used after initial phase when you want to assess if there is organ congestion or organ edema, let's say, and that may aid you to perform a better decision on whether it's time to start evacuating fluids or not. Great. And moving on to types of IV fluids, um, can you discuss the two types of isotonic crystallite solutions? Okay. There are two types, or two main types of crystallite solutions. Uh, we have a normal saline or 0.9% saline, which has been the standard of care in many, many places. So uh, it has high chloride concentration. It has equal sodium to chloride concentration at on 154 and then we have another class of balanced solutions where you have a lower chloride content and a buffer is added to the solution. So uh, the most well-known example is lactated ringer, where part of the sodium is given as lactated sodium, right? And you have acetated ringers where you have sodium acetate as a buffer. And then you have other solutions like plasmolite, for example, where you have acetate and gluconate as buffer. So those solutions have a lower chloride content and they have been hypothesized to be associated with better outcomes for critically ill patients or for septic patients specifically, because it seems that hyperchloremia may be related to organ dysfunction, perhaps more uh, importantly, kidney dysfunction. So that leads to my next question. Um, can you discuss the mortality outcomes of these studies that look compared balanced solutions versus saline? Okay. So we have five major trials that assess uh, you know, the effects of balanced solutions in critically ill patients. We have the split trial, uh, the SALT trial, the SMART trial, BASICS, and PLUS. So split was a plus or randomized trial. The primary endpoint was not mortality. Then we had SALT, that was a pilot for the SMART trial, uh, and the primary endpoint was a composite endpoint of mortality, use of kidney replacement therapy, or doubling of creatinine. And then we have two large individually randomized controlled trials. One is BASICS and the other one is PLUS. So individually, the only trial that yield positive results, uh, let's say from a traditional frequencies framework, is the SMART trial, where there was 
patients that were in clusters where they were receiving balanced solutions, they had a lower incidence of the composite endpoint of mortality, uh, use of kidney replacement therapy, or doubling of creatinine. The other trials, they all provided no results or neutral results, let's say, for mortality. There is an aggregated trial meta-analysis published uh, early last year by Noemi Hamon. And when all those trials are combined together with other smaller trials, we had the p-value for mortality was 0.10. But under a Bayesian framework, we could say that there was a high probability of benefit, around 90% probability that balanced solutions decrease in mortality over on all critically ill patients, including septic patients. However, I would just like to highlight that one population that may be actually harmed by balanced solutions are patients with traumatic brain injury. So these patients with high intracranial pressure, especially traumatic brain injury, they may not benefit from balanced solutions. And I would favor saline for those patients. For the remaining patients, including the septic patients, I'll say that evidence is not so far definitive, but the best evidence we have should let's say, favors balanced solutions so far. And the most commonly used colloid in the ICU is human albumin. What have studies found comparing albumin with saline in patients with sepsis? So studies have been mostly neutral for comparison between albumin and, and saline in the ICU. So the biggest trial was the SAFE trial that was published more than 10 years ago. That was a neutral trial. Albumin was, has also been shown to increase mortality in traumatic brain injury patients. So far, we have, we can provide actually a no recommendation uh, for albumin use as a routine therapy in sepsis, but we have actually no trials that actively resuscitated patients with albumin early on, right? So most trials focus on replenishing albumin levels, but not resuscitating using albumin. So I feel like there is more research needed on this. And what do we know about the use of semi-synthetic colloid solutions, such as hydroxyethyl starch in patients with sepsis? This field has been very well studied, right? So specifically in sepsis, we have the VZEP trial and the 6S trial that were published some time ago to, uh, those trials are mostly focused on, on, on septic patients. And then we have the large CHESS trial that assessed a broad population of critically ill patients. And in sepsis, starches were associated with higher mortality and more acute kidney injury. And even in a broad population of critically ill patients, like in the CHESS trial, there was some suggestion of more kidney injury in the overall population. So we feel like there is no further role for starches as a food for resuscitation or maintenance in septic patients. Great. And before closing, I would just wanted you to discuss what studies have shown about the rate of infusion of IV fluids and clinical outcomes. So as I mentioned before, when we started, so faster infusion rates may be associated with more tissue edema, right? So with more, let's say, leakage from fluid from the intravascular to the interstitial space. So it's conceivable that if you give a lot of fluids very fast, it may actually increase tissue edema and maybe that could be related to worse outcomes. So we tested that hypothesis in the BASICS trial. The BASICS trial was a factorial trial. So we, we compared two infusion rates for fluid boluses in critically ill patients. We compared a half a liter over half an hour, which seems to be pretty standard or pretty common actually, uh, with a half a liter over one hour and a half. So let's say a slower infusion rate. And results for the primary endpoint at nine days were neutral. So we could not find a difference in mortality for when we compared those two infusion rates. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us about this interesting and important topic and review. That was Dr. Fernando Zampieri from the Department of Critical Care Medicine at the University of Alberta in Canada. And I'm Dr. Kristen Walter. This episode was produced by Daniel Morrow at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.